First, I want to thank the International Shaw Society for this opportunity to talk about my new book. And I'm grateful to my longtime friend Gustavo for putting together this wonderful conference. I wish I could be with you today. Today I'll be talking about two of Shaw's most popular plays, Pygmalion and Major Barbara, from three vantage points. One is the Shavian sisters, Eliza Doolittle and Barbara Undershaft. The second is Shaw's language choices. The third is Shaw's stagecraft, what I'll be calling metadrama. Simmering beneath all of this is yet another issue, concerns about Shaw's reputation today and in the future. In 1921, Shaw was in his mid-60s and still as vigorous as ever. St. Joan was yet to come, and Back to Methuselah was about to have its first performance. But Shaw was starting to notice a shift in his reputation. He said, I see there is a tendency to begin treating me like an archbishop. He had attained the status of a great man, and that meant that he had become safe. His radical edge was gone, at least in the eyes of the British public. Today, more than a hundred years later, we're the ones who worry about Shaw's reputation. We think of him as a classic writer, brilliant in his own time, but out of touch with today's world. How do we make him relevant to today's theatergoers and scholars? This book is one attempt at an answer. To begin, I think we're asking the wrong question. Instead of seeking to rehabilitate and modernize Shaw, we should be asking how we can catch up with him. I see him transitioning into postmodernism decades before other famous thinkers did. Explaining the hows and whys this happened is one of the purposes of this talk. One of my key concepts is energy. Here are two ideas that helped shape my book. Shaw's stagecraft and language are capsules of hidden energy. Shaw's dramatic and language choices often resisted his attempts to control them. Let's begin with a language example from Major Barbara. In January 2021, I was working on a chapter about the undershaft maxims in Major Barbara. This, these maxims, called the faith of an armorer, serve as a kind of mission statement for the munitions works. They also reinforce one of the important ideas in the play, the importance of money. Almost every and Andrew Undershaft since King James I had contributed a maxim. They support the argument that Shaw laid out in his preface to Major Barbara. Money is the most important thing in the world. I hear echoes of the King James Bible in some of those maxims. I've marked the ones I hear in red. None have the right to judge, to heaven the victory, a sword in her hand, and so on. We've left the business world and entered the realm of pure, exalted spiritual truth. <clears throat> Barbara's father especially admires the maxim that his predecessor wrote. But I'd been reading Jacques Derrida for a long time, and I saw something else in those maxims self-serving ideas dressed up in mystical language. Here's what I wrote on January 5. What do we learn from those maxims? Everyone is entitled to wield a weapon, including, presumably, terrorists, child abusers, and madmen. Violence, not professional policing or social justice, is essential to keeping the peace. Nothing ever gets done unless men are willing to kill for it. No schools are built, no cures are found, no human rights are bestowed. The next day was January 6. That afternoon, my husband called me away from my laptop to look at this scene on our TV. Many of us believe that there are two kinds of language, and I have to confess, I held this view myself for many years. One kind is everyday language that requires processing and critical thinking. The other kind is truth-telling, the realm of the prophets and the philosophers. Their lofty language provides us with a direct route to enlightenment 
that we can absorb without independent mental activity. But Derrida insists, and Shaw knew this before Derrida was even born, that those two categories don't exist. Language is language, even when God is talking. We still have to use the language software in our heads to process what we're hearing. I will return to language later in this talk. Now I'd like to turn to our Shavian sisters. Eliza Doolittle and Barbara Undershaft are unlikely sisters. They're separated by social class, education, life experience, marital prospects, and more. But there are significant connections as well. First, both women were fathered by Bernard Shaw. Second, both of them work for pay, unusual in the Edwardian period. Third, both of them are preoccupied with poverty. Fourth, they both grew up with little paternal care. More important, in my view, are two problems they share. Both Eliza and Barbara have been co-opted by powerful men who use them for their own purposes. Until Andrew Undershaft and Henry Higgins crashed into their lives, our Shavian sisters knew exactly what they wanted and were working hard to get it. In the end, though, their wishes have turned to dust. Barbara and Eliza will have to start over. And that points to another similarity. Both Barbara and Eliza are going to marry men who are head over heels in love with them. Unfortunately, though, Freddie and Adolphus probably won't be helping our Shavian sisters to achieve their dreams in any significant way. Freddie in Pygmalion has very little real world experience. Adolphus in Major Barbara is too excited about his new career and potential wealth to concern himself much with Barbara's problems. There's an ominous warning about what lies ahead at the end of Act Two. Adolphus leaves Barbara behind, weeping over her faith crisis, to march triumphantly to the assembly hall with Andrew and the Salvationists. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about something unexpected that happened while I was writing my book, about Eliza and Barbara. If they had been real women, they would probably never cross each other's paths. Their backgrounds are too different. But Eliza and Barbara inhabit a literary universe, a world of words created by a brilliant playwright. I was able to bring them together just by tapping some keys on a computer keyboard. What happened next was a surprise. Our two plays turned into commentaries on each other. Sometimes they illuminated each other in unexpected ways. At other times, the opposite happened, and Pygmalion posed a challenge to Major Barbara, or vice versa. Here's an example. In Pygmalion, Eliza Doolittle is tempted with two easy escape routes from poverty. The first is adoption, and the second is a socially advantageous marriage. In Act 4, Higgins suggests that his mother could provide a match for Eliza. In Act 5, he offers to adopt Eliza himself and settle money on her. She rejects both offers. But Andrew Undershaft and Major Barbara grew up with the same problem, poverty, and was offered the same opportunities, adoption and a society marriage. The difference is that Andrew accepted them. His masculine sex protected him from the dangers that Eliza might face if she made those choices, falling under the control of a man who had the advantages of money and power. It sounds a lot like feminism in a time that was much less enlightened about roles for women. And that means we've just had an encounter with the disruptive energy I mentioned earlier. Here's another example of how our plays challenge each other, the career question. Twice, Eliza proposes to be a speech assistant or teacher, once in Act 5 of Pygmalion and again in the sequel. The first time, Higgins indignantly vetoes her plan. The second time, though, Higgins and Pickering gently persuade her that she doesn't have the right credentials. Shaw, standing in the shadows of the play, implicitly agrees. 
his oh-so-reasonable tone in the sequel suggests that it would have been unthinkable for Eliza to make money from the training Higgins gave her. No one suggests that Eliza could put her phonetics training to use by, say, hosting a conversation circle in a church basement to help ambitious flower girls improve their speech. Eliza is supposed to go on with her life as if those six months at Wimp Wimpole Street with a world-class speech e expert never happened. But Adolphus and Major Barbara is just as unqualified when he proposes to take over the munitions works. Adolphus doesn't even know basic math, simple things like whether three-fifths is bigger or smaller than a half. And yet he is instantly offered an apprenticeship to learn how to run the business. By contrast, nobody suggests training Eliza to be a teaching assistant. But perhaps we're being unfair to Shaw and the characters he created. This was the early 1900s. Women couldn't even vote back then. Is it fair for us to be thinking about opportunities for women? My answer is yes, and I suspect that even some audience members would have been thinking along those lines. England had already seen many examples of what women were capable of doing. The formidable Queen Victoria had just died after an astonishing 63 years on the throne. Florence Nightingale had founded the modern nursing profession, reformed the army, and trained as a statistician, as well as serving as a government consultant on Indian affairs. Beatrice Webb was making a name for herself in social issues, and the Salvation Army had been allowing women to play leadership roles since 1865. We should also remember Lady Brittomart, whom Shaw described as a woman with plenty of practical ability and worldly experience. Shaw even had a female role model in his own family, his mother. Her name was Elizabeth Shaw, and her story has many parallels with Eliza's story. Note the similar names. Elizabeth, Eliza. Mrs. Shaw studied voice with a gifted teacher, became his assistant, and then broke with him to become a voice teacher herself but Eliza is forbidden to take one step in that direction. Major Barbara and Pygmalion weren't intended to be feminist plays, and I certainly didn't plan to write a feminist book. My point is that when a play is as packed with energy as our two plans are, concepts like unity and coherence turn into phantoms. Bernard Shaw himself couldn't control the swirling forces that he unleashed when he wrote Pygmalion and Major Barbara. Those swirling forces include our next topic, Shaw's stagecraft choices. I'll be using the relatively new term, metadrama. Although the term is new, the basic meaning of metadrama goes back at least as far as Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. What's new is the meta idea, our heightened awareness of the dramatic strategies we see on stage. I'm going to ask you to imagine a pizza delivery. The pizza arrives in a box. That box is a delivery system. We eat the pizza and throw away the box. Similarly, we look through Shaw's delivery system as we watch one of his plays. But I think that delivery system is worth exploring and not just for drama specialists. We sometimes assume that audiences want to focus only on the characters and stories. The mechanics of playwriting don't interest them. My argument though is that Shaw didn't just want a pit of philosophers, he wanted a pit of playwrights, too. Watching a Shaw play is an active process. We help Shaw and the actors create the meaning. Act One of Major Barbara is almost a textbook on how to write an effective play. Everything is there. Exposition, character development, theme, plot, conflict, in a dramatic package that has delighted audiences for more than 100 years. 
all of this seems so obvious that it's almost not worth mentioning until we start talking about Act One of Pygmalion. Unlike Major Barbara, the first minute or so of Pygmalion lacks just about every element we might expect from a first-class play. I want you to imagine that we've just taken a trip in a time machine. We've gone back to 1914 London when Pygmalion was first being performed in England. Suddenly, we all find ourselves wearing evening clothes, watching a play at Covent Garden. When the show ends, we leave the theater and start looking for our time machine to bring us back to 2022. There's a problem, though. It started raining hard. There's a lot of confusion with market workers dodging theater goers as they head for shelter. People are scrambling for taxis and shivering families are sniping irritably at each other. And then, just as suddenly, we find ourselves back in this room in our regular clothes, dry and warm. Now we're looking back on that magical trip and realizing that it exactly duplicated the opening moments in Pygmalion. Those first moments don't offer any of the elements we expect from a play. Exposition, character development, theme, plot, and so on. We might remember the old complaints that Shaw wasn't really a playwright and his dramatic works weren't really plays. If you and I had bought tickets to Pygmalion back in 1914, the title would have led us to expect a transformation story, an artist with the power to make their creation come to life. But the opening moments in the play don't give us a single hint about the transformation story we're expecting if the play is staged the way Shaw wrote it. I've never seen a production st staged that way, and I'd be interested in knowing whether any of you have seen that kind of production. In the productions I've seen, the chaos and bewilderment are missing. We know right away that Eliza is going to be the Galatea figure. Spotlights and other theatrical tricks ensure that we're paying close attention to her right at the beginning. In the Lincoln Center production of My Fair Lady, for example, Eliza was all alone on stage when the play began. The other characters gradually joined her and filled the stage. So, in the productions I've seen, the chaos and bewilderment are missing. We know right away that Eliza is going to be the Galatea figure. Think about the London production back in 1914. Many theater goers would instantly have recognized Stella Campbell, the actor playing Eliza Doolittle. As written, Pygmalion puzzles us when the curtain goes up for the first time. Novelists can write lengthy books, but playwrights have only a few hours to tell a complicated story. Theater goers need to leave by 11 o'clock. Every second is precious. Why did Shaw choose to begin his play that way? Bertolt Brecht has a hint for us. The illusion created by the theater must be a partial one in order that it may always be recognized as an illusion. That sounded strange to me when I first read it. I've always gone to the theater to escape reality and lose myself in someone else's story. Is Brecht right? Do playwrights really want to keep bringing us back to reality? I'm not going to claim that I know what Bernard Shaw was thinking about when he wrote Pygmalion, but I am going to hazard a guess. Eliza Doolittle is a teenager who's waging a fierce battle for survival. Henry Higgins, on the other hand, has everything going for him, social position, education, and a lucrative career. He can afford to get lost in a fantasy of his own making. She can't. Pygmalion keeps reminding us of the difference between make-believe and reality. Right from the moment when the curtain goes up and we see people leaving a theater after a performance. Now let's return to Major Barbara and a problem that Shaw was grappling with when he wrote that play. Andrew Undershaft is a businessman who, frankly, rarely does anything but talk. That's not conducive to drama, which typically puts characters into a variety of situations in order to make them complex and multifaceted. Shaw, brilliant playwright that he was, found ways to solve that problem. One of them involved a bouquet of flowers. 
You'll remember that Andrew has been estranged from his family for many years. He doesn't recognize his son, and his family has never seen the munitions works. In Act 3, the family tours the factory village for the first time. After they've seen everything, they meet with Andrew, who was busy in his office when they arrived. Lady Brittemort is carrying a bouquet of flowers. Andrew sniffs them and asks where they came from. She explains that the men presented them to her in the church. The flowers are never mentioned again, and the play moves on to a lively debate about warfare, wealth, and morality. But let's linger with that bouquet for a moment or two. We never see the workers who presented the flowers, but we can imagine the surprised looks when the news spread that the boss's family was going to tour the factory. What family? Andrew never talked about them. There were no trips to London for family celebrations, no conversations about graduations and other milestones. There weren't even any family pictures in his office. What to do? The workers got together and decided to, honors and to honor Andrew's wife as if the family unit had been intact all those years. Hence the flowers. Shaw didn't have time to depict the ceremony on stage, but he wanted us to hear about it. It's one of many small details that tell us how humane and wonderful the factory village is. And there's more, in my opinion. The backstory for the play, The End of the Marriage and Long Estrangement, becomes more vivid and real to us in the audience when we picture those workers trying to figure out what to do. Another point, Shaw is setting, up, setting us up to realize the futility of Barbara's later proposal to save those men. They don't need converting. They already have a church, four of them actually, and they know how to act graciously. Most important, in my opinion, is that the flower ceremony helps bring Andrew's character to life. He arrived empty-handed on both of his visits to the Wilt Wilton Crescent House. He didn't even bother to be on hand at the factory village when his family arrived for their tour. He was too busy reading reports about the success of a new weapon. All of that from a bouquet of flowers. What I'm suggesting here is that there may be undiscovered Shavian jewels in many of Shaw's plays. If we try an approach that seems deceptively simple, watch on stage or on the internet or just in your own brain as one of his plays unfolds moment by moment. What do you see? hear, and think. In essence, I'm inviting you to think of yourself as Shaw's playwriting partner. I said earlier that we would be returning to language. I want to offer you one more postmodern idea. Language has its own agenda, which may not be the same agenda we have when we're speaking or writing. It's an important energy source for Shaw, and one that's often overlooked. It begins with the act of naming, a topic of immense interest to contemporary philosophers, and an act that Shaw probed again and again in his prefaces. In a moment, I'll be giving you an example of a naming issue from Major Barbara. By the way, even that's interesting. Pygmalion, not Major Barbara, is widely regarded as Shaw's language play. We're seeing another example of the explosions of energy in Shaw. Nothing is ever tidy. Nothing ever stays put. <clears throat> the book of Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve named everything they saw. We picture a pointing process. The truth, though, is that naming is a classification process, something we've known since Linnaeus. It's the category, not just the object, that helps determine the meaning. But life is messy and complicated. Sometimes we don't know the proper category for an object or an experience, and that means we can't process it. This is immensely important to Shaw. The need for categories is one reason why it's so important, for example, for students to develop effective language skills. Here's an example. If you say you're upset, the word is so vague that there's no way to act on it. But when you break down upset into categories and specifics, 
you may be able to see a pathway to resolution. I have two Shavian examples for Major Barbara. The first is poverty. Before you can solve it, you have to put, in, put it into a category. Which will it be? And now you're looking at Shaw's preface to Major Barbara. My second example concerns Morrison, who's Lady Brittemort's longtime butler. Morrison remembers Andrew from years ago before the marital split. One of Morrison's duties is a language task. He classifies the people who come to the door. Guests are announced, workers are directed to the back door, and family members walk in. Three categories, easy enough, until Andrew Undershaft is invited to visit. Is he a guest or a family member? Morrison's language toolbox fail him. Andrew and Lady Brittemort are still legally married, but he hasn't set, house, set foot in the house for many years. He's hardly the head of the household. But he's not just a visitor either. After all, he paid for the house, and he's still supporting the inhabitants. Morrison finally resorts to the uh, Mr. Andrew Undershaft. The stage directions add that Morrison retreats in confusion. It gets worse. Two days later, Andrew is back. Now the visitor family member question is even more acute. If Andrew and Lady Brittemore are reconciling, it would be a hideous insult to announce him as a visitor. But if they're not, it would be presumptuous to treat him like a visitor. Once again, there's no linguistic tool to help Morrison out. Finally, in desperation, he does something that is servant should never do. He apologetically asks his boss an intimate question about her personal affairs. And here's the dialogue from the play. And now I want to circle back to that simmering pot of water, the concerns about Shaw's reputation that are never far from the minds of Shavians. I hope you will think about intriguing new ideas that you encounter in your reading, teaching, and everyday experience, and then look for a connection to Shaw. Don't be overly impressed by the critics. My prediction is that you'll soon be discovering new insights into one of the greatest playwrights ever. You'll have an exciting literary adventure yourself. Even better, you'll be advancing Shaw scholarships in fresh and exciting ways. And that is my challenge for you. Thank you.